So the excavator shown below is supported by pins at A, B, and K. So A, B, K. And this is some excavator and it's probably scooping up some dirt or something like that. The bucket of the excavator experiences a resistance in the form of a distributed load. Okay, yeah, there's that resistance of the dirt that we're trying to pick up. Remember DH, DH, the hydraulic cylinder BC, BC, and the outer portion of the continuous member JGA are in parallel. So the outer portion of the continuous member, J, G, E, A. So what they're telling me is that this thing is actually one piece of metal. So you want to make sure you can visualize what this means. Here's this J, G, E, A. It's one solid piece of metal here. And we have this hole right here where the pin at G inserts into. Now also contacting this pin G is this upper member here which I'll draw in green and that's CDG and it also has a hole where that pin inserts into so you want to be able to visualize how all of these pieces are coming together like this. So on this pin G, we're going to have two forces, two effects. The force from JGEA, the blue, and the force from CDG, the green. And of course, and of course for equilibrium, these forces must be equal and opposite. Really make sure you're okay with this because both B and C talk about the pin at G. So, continuing on, yeah, the, they're saying the outer portion of this continue, continuous member are parallel. So here is the outer portion of this whole thing, and they're telling us that this is parallel with this and this. <clears throat> so they're all in the same direction, and their direction seems to be noted by this 65. I might mark this right here and mark them all as being in that same 65 degree angle direction. And then lastly, we have member CDG is six feet long, so let me just find that. CDG, this one, six feet long. Okay. It's all about reading this whole thing and just putting it all in your picture so now all you have you have all the information on your picture you really just have to reference your picture you've sort of uh, converted all this prom description into your your form and I find that that is a very useful thing to do part A find the actual axial force in the hydraulic cylinder BC well here's BC so here it is. I'm going to make sure I note that 65 degree angle. So I noticed that this member is a two force member and two force members are great for us. You should always be looking around for two force members. I know this thing is a two force member because there are only two things touching this member. We have a pin support B in contact so that'll be one force and this one force has two components maybe BX left and BY up remember it's really only one force though these two are just the two smaller components of that one true force B and then we have the effect over here now looking at pin joint C there's only two things in contact with this pin joint C. The force from CDG and the force from this guy, CB. 
So since there's only two forces, these two forces must be equal. What that says to me is that all the force that this guy puts on this pin is transferred to this member. And this is and this is something I was really trying to emphasize when I was in the Frames and Machines introduction video. Since there's only two forces acting on this pin C, then these two forces must be equal. And therefore, I can really just treat this CDG like it's transferring its force onto here directly. I don't have to worry about any of this force going anywhere else. So I don't have to get really complicated here. So really I can just call this CX and CY if I wanted. If you want to see some situations where it gets complicated and you simply can't do this, check out my introduction video on frames and machines. I see in this entire problem though, all of our junctions, at each one of our junctions, there's only two things interacting. So we're, we're not going to have any very, very dangerous situations. Okay, back to my main point. This is a two force member right here. That means that these two forces must be along the same line of action. So this force C might be like this and that force B might be like this if we're assuming tension. And of course for equilibrium our force C must equal our force B. Now this is nice but unfortunately we don't have enough information to figure this out. And this kind of seems weird because we really only have two unknowns here, the force from B and the force from C, but if we write out some forces X and Y, or even our some moments, we won't get anywhere. And let me just write that out for you just so you can see that real quick. So, if I try adding up my forces in the X, even if I think splitting up the C and B forces based on the fact that I know the direction, I know that's 65, it won't help. These two forces must balance. If you look at my math, the signs of 65 cancel out. What do we learn? C is equal to B. Well, great, we already knew that. Same dilemma for some forces in the Y. The cosines cancel out. Even if we try doing a sum of the moments about point B, that's not going to work. Imagine putting this term to the right hand side of the equation. I'll have a, now I'll have a C on both sides of the equation and then they'll cancel out. So I'm really not able to get any solid answers here. So my next best plan is to start where there are knowns. This load is really our only solid number here and we'll just work our way through this machine until we arrive here. So I'll make a free body diagram of this member. So here's the shovel. I already know I have this rectangular load here. And right off the bat I can simplify this rectangular load. The total force that represents this whole thing is going to act in the middle of the rectangle and the magnitude of this total force will be the area of the, area of the rectangle. So 2 times 75 will get 150. Looking at J, I see that it's a, a simple scenario, simple junction, only two things coming together at this pin, so that's good. This member that's coming into contact here is not a two force member which means the only thing we can say here about the force that JGA puts on the shovel is that it has two components. The X will assume to be to the left and the Y will just assume to be up. Now we see that HD comes into contact here at 
join H and it's another simple scenario only two members come into contact at this pin so no crazy force transmission going on like that and HD is a two force member so that's really good if we want to assume that HD is in tension that means we'll assume that the force is coming out like this and I know this because of Newton's third law if HD puts this force onto this shovel member that means the shovel member puts the same force on HD so this would be tension so here is me assuming that HD is in tension but of course you can assume it to be whatever you want assuming tension is just a convention so the nice thing here is that because this is a two force member we essentially know this force's direction if I extended this down this would be my 65 here so making another vertical line right here this would be 65 as well so this whole force is really just one unknown one component will be H cosine 65 the other will be H sine of 65 whereas this because we don't know the direction of this force this is going to be two unknowns JX and JY so I'll start by doing a sum of the moments about point J so let's start with H first this H has two components we'll have a downer, downwards Y component and a rightwards X component of course this Y component here will create no moment this line of action is through our moment point now this one the X component definitely will but don't fall into the trap that thinking that this is the moment arm remember this right triangle here that we draw just helps us use sine and cosine to split this force H into its components but of course in reality this force is acting at this point and of course so are its components so this X component of H which will be H sine of 65 I mistakenly wrote 25 there give me one second H sine of 65 will have that same moment arm of 2 yeah so just watch out creating those right triangles this component is not just applied in the air here then we have the moment of the 150 it will be spinning this object this way clockwise well my positive is counterclockwise so I give this a negative and the same thing went for that X component of H it wanted to spin clockwise about J so both are negative moments so we'll run this calculation and we'll be able to calculate what H is and we'll get that H is a negative 413.8 pounds this H force is actually acting this way so let me just redraw my picture so here's H and here's my 65 so now with this known we can do some forces in the X to figure out JX and some forces in the Y to figure out JY so here's my sum forces in the X our X component of that H is going the negative X and I still use the sine of 65 to get it and of course this 150 is going in the negative and so is our J in calculating JX we'll get negative 225 so in actuality this component is actually acting to the right all right now for the Y so we just have the Y component of our H which we can get using the cosine of 65 as well as our JY 
and solving for JY, we'll get that it's a negative 175. So I'll change my direction for JY to be acting downwards. So we've done everything we can with this free body diagram here. So the next question is, where do we go? Here or to this member? Looking at our member JGEA, let's see how many unknowns we got. Well, we know this, that's no problem. Here, we will have the force from this upper member. Is this member a two-force member? No, it's not. CDG has three things touching it. So there's going to be two unknowns here from that upper member CDG. We're going to have a force here. This is a two-force member, though. So therefore, we know the direction of that force. And therefore, it'll be one unknown. This is a pin. All we know about the force from that pin is it's going to have two components, therefore two unknowns. So we have five unknowns here, so we don't want to analyze this system yet. So therefore, we will go to HD. So looking at HD, we know that if HD exerts this force, that 413.8, on that shovel, the shovel is going to do the exact same force just in the opposite direction, that 413.8. And since there's only one other force on this member HD over here, that means that this one force must be directly opposing that other 413.8. So we have that. So pretty simple with this member. So this work didn't really affect our member JGEA. So now I'm thinking let's go to CDG. Well for CDG, I know that at D, we have the force from member HD coming in. So Newton's third law says that HD will be putting a force, that same 413, just coming in like this. I'll make sure I note the angle. That angle is going to be that same 65 here. Yeah, here is that uh, 413 coming in to CDG. Looking downwards at G here, we're going to have the force from that big member, JGEA. JGEA is not a two-force member, therefore we have no idea where this force is going to go. So therefore the only thing I can say about it is that there's going to be two components. I'll assume G X to the left and G Y going up. Looking at C, we know we're going to have the force from our two force member CB coming into play. So I'll just assume that is coming in like this. Oops. This right here. I can call this C, I can call this the force CB, I can call it whatever I want. I'll just call it C. But it's really the force from that two force member CB. And I know it's angled, that same 65. This one right here. Because that force will be acting in the same direction as the member because it's a two-force member. That's how they work. So this force is what I want. This is the force that CB is exerting on CDG. Therefore, if I find that out, I have basically, you know, once I've used Newton's third law, found the force exerted onto CB. 
So if I do a sum of my moments about point G, I know I can figure this out. So I will write out that sum moments equation. So looking at C first, the Y component of C will create no moment about G. The X component, which will be C sine of 65, will, of course we remember that that X component is of course applied at that point C, the moment arm will be this distance, which is this 6 right here. And this component wants to rotate us counterclockwise, which is my positive rotational direction. Similar thing going on with my 413, only its X component creates a moment, so 413.8 sine of 65. Of course, that X component is actually applied here, which makes this its moment arm from D to G. Now, looking at our main prom picture, they don't really give us a dimension here, but look, the distance between H and J is 2. So will the distance between D and G. These two members here are on the same exact slope. So there's really, they're parallel. So if this is 2, this is going to be 2. So the moment arm is 2 for that. So solving for C, I'll get 138 pounds. And I'm actually getting positive this time around. So this force really is in this direction. Of course, we can do a quick Newton's third law. If CB puts this 138 on CDG, CDG puts this 138 on CB. CB is a two-force member. Therefore, that only other force must be acting in this direction with 138. So CB is in compression. So that is the answer to BC. I'm not sure if they wanted the force on CB or maybe the force that CB is exerting, but it's 138. So 138 pounds. So now we need to determine the pin reactions at G. And the pin reactions at G will be these guys. So we just need to solve for those. And it looks like we can do that with a sum forces in the X and a sum forces in the Y. So I'll have the X component of the 138 going to the left. And I use sine to get it. The X component of the 413.8 going to the right, and I also use sine to get that one, and of course I have GX going to the left. And solving for GX, I'll get a positive 250. So in the Y, I'll have the Y component of 138 going up, so positive 138 cosine 65. The y component of the 413 is going down to minus, and then I've assumed gy to be acting up. And I'll get a positive 116.6. So gy is indeed acting in the positive y. So these two right here, GY and GX, are my pin reactions at G. Now for part C. If the pin at G can safely support a force with a magnitude of 260 pounds, you got to be very careful here. This right here is the force that the pin puts on member CDG. 
Again, this is a simple, simple junction here, only two things going on, so I'm very confident saying that. So if I do the Newton's third law, that means that I have 116.6 going down and 250 going to the right. Of course, this pin must be in equilibrium. The only other thing touching this pin is that lower member JGEA. So therefore, JGEA must put these same two forces to oppose them. Remember, each one of these two components are two smaller parts of a much larger force that is actually happening. We, this is the actual force that this pin is feeling. This pin is feeling one force like this diagonally down and one force diagonally up. We need to figure out what this is because this is the true force that the pin is feeling. To do that we just do Pythagorean theorem. And if we do that we'll get around 276 pounds. So this pin is feeling at 276 this way and a 276 this way. 276 is bigger than that 260. So this pin G will not be able to safely support um, this loading here. So the answer to that is a no. All right. Just remember your Newton's third law. Remember to look for two force members and just work your way through this frame or machine. We had uh, none of the dangerous junctions that I warned you about in the Frames and Machines intro video. So, hope all that made sense. Feel free to ask me any questions you may have.